Wait, how old are both of you guys, by the way? I'm 41. I'm 38. Guys, this is crazy. Like, I would have thought you guys were like late 20s, early 30s. So we should listen to these people is what I'm saying. Are either of you single? If you're gonna slide in, I think you should make, make your profile public. We talk a lot about body positivity, body dysmorphia. I don't see a lot of men talking about that topic. I think we underappreciate the detrimental effects that chronic social media use can have on mental health. We live in a, a really weird time where you can put something crazy online, suddenly fall under the scrutiny of the entire universe. I definitely had body dysmorphia. I was way too skinny. I look back on photos and I'm like, how was that me and how did I not realize that? And now it's kind of completely the opposite. Being overly muscular or like too fit is kind of like weirdly like a turnoff. People need to know that carbs don't necessarily make you fat. And not only that, but they can be an incredibly powerful tool to use to have better workouts. I mean, people are putting all kinds of things up there. Yeah, butts. suppositories. You've never been in a suppository? No, let's talk about it. What do you put up your butt? I've tried NAD. Like up in your, your butt, butt hole? Yeah. Wow, fascinating. Guys, welcome back to the Pursuit of Wellness podcast. Today we have our first ever round table episode. I have two guests with me and friends of mine who I consider to be super on the pulse when it comes to health and wellness, Max Lugavere and Crosby Taylor. We are going to cover a number of interesting topics today, but first, do you guys mind introducing yourselves? Tell us who you are and your involvement in the health industry. Sure, I guess I'll go first. Uh, my name is Max Lugavere. I'm a health and science journalist. I am an author. I've written a number of books, Genius Foods, The Genius Life, Genius Kitchen. I host a podcast called The Genius Life, and I do a lot of education and advocacy around um, nutrition, holistic health, as it pertains to lengthening collectively our health spans and our lifespans. Amazing. Well, that's a really, really good intro. <laughs> I try. I mean, I don't know if I can follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Crosby Taylor. Uh, my health journey started about ten years ago. I had a lot of different gut issues, so. Embarking into the health field for me was all about fixing my gut and in that, you know, healing my health in that kind of way. So that kind of brought me into places where I was a Chinese herbalist. I, I got certified as a junior herbalist. I um, started personal training and have a background and, and consider myself a fitness expert. And I also then started making foods that wouldn't be inflammatory and hurt my stomach. So that turned into my segue to making healthy desserts. So I have a dessert company, uh, founded a company called Crosby's Baking Co. We make gluten, grain, refined sugar-free desserts. And we also exclude things like almond flour and seed oils, which I think can be inflammatory, uh, definitely eaten in excess. So yeah, um, and now it's just kind of for me all about spreading the word for health and wellness uh, through my Instagram channel and within my business. Amazing, and how do you guys know each other? Actually, it's kind of a funny story. We met when, um, as I mentioned, so I've done, uh, I've been a journalist my entire professional career, and about 10 years ago, I transitioned to focus exclusively on health science. And around that time, I was, um, I had yet to publish any of my books or build the platform that I, that I have now, and I was essentially hired to cover uh, an event, a big sort of like health and wellness biohacking event for Yahoo, which, you know, yahoo.com, big sort of news portal. And I was actually one of the people that I was tasked to interview was Crosby. And so I was like literally <laughs> Yahoo there. Health, right? What? Yeah, it was yeah, Yahoo Health, yeah. Yeah, and so I was like interviewing him about his desserts, which yeah. at the time, I mean, I think now we take for granted the fact that you can find sugar-free, quote-unquote keto, better for you desserts fairly commonly. Mm. I mean, here in LA, it's super, they're super easy to find. But at the time, he, I mean, Crosby is definitely very much a pioneer in that space. He was making some of the best blondies, brownies, cookies that you'd ever have. They were, you would never be able to tell that they were sugar-free and grain-free, which is sort of like a hallmark of, you know, staple of like his, his bakery products. Yeah. And I thought Max was pretty famous at the time. So I was like, Wow, Max is, cool. is pretty famous. He's a lot more famous now, but even then, that was like eight years, eight, yeah, eight, eight years eight, ago. Eight to, to it was at the Bulletproof Conference, the first ever Bulletproof Conference, I think. Yeah, in Pasadena. In Pasadena, yeah. You were and speaking, I was working, right? I was speaking because uh, I was the first ambassador for Dave Asprey for Bulletproof. Like before, it oh, was wow. a massive brand. He had like the butter coffee. That was it. Before the supplements and everything, he was only using you know the, the butter and the MC.
desserts to these people. So your audience is probably going to be like, what's well, fine? <laughs> I know, but they, they are my age, so I think they'll remember. Oh, that. really? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Gen Z would be like, huh? Like, what is... Well, TikTok's like the new Vine. T it is the new Vine, yeah. But yeah, so, so then uh, it turned into kind of a, a, fr a big friendship after that. I think we ran into each other at Air One. Yeah. Uh, like a week later. Classic. And then yeah. He was like, yo, <laughs> conference. <laughs> Men are so funny. Like, BFF imagine if girls life. made friends that way. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about a number of topics because I feel like whenever I see you guys, we're all trying something new. We're on a new health wave. We found the 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 competition that I get to have with myself in the gym and it's also a time for me to meditate it's it's meditative for me in the sense that I get to be really I have to be really present when I'm when I'm when you're lifting weights I mean on a treadmill walking or running you can kind of zone out a little bit but if you're not there present with the weight um, it's a form of I guess yeah I guess it's a form of meditation and I so I just I genuinely really enjoy it and um, and so my approach, I think for a long time has been essentially like a bodybuilding approach. I don't really <clears> like <throat> low repetition lifts. It's just, I feel like too, I just have like, I have a, a degree of aversion to it. I definitely dip into those lower rep ranges occasionally, which is thought to be better for, for building strength. But I tend to have a more bodybuilding style routine. And I've gotten really focused lately. There's a lot of really good and interesting research now coming out from the field of, of exercise science. So I feel like I've been in a space where I've really dialed in my, my workouts as of late. Um, one of the things that I'm, that a few of the things that I've been really leaning into is one, longer rest periods. I think a lot of people have this idea that your rest periods should be really short, but actually that kind of turns your workouts into more, and I think there's a time and place for it, but it turns your workouts into a more cardio style effort and for you to really reap the most benefit from a strength and hypertrophy pers perspective there is benefit to actually like spending a longer having a longer rest period so that's been something that i've been toying with and then also um there's a lot of research now and a lot of people talking and you know specifically about uh tension under load so like really accentuating the um, the eccentric, eccentric portion of the lift. So when you're like, when your muscle is at its most lengthened, mm. seems to be where you get a lot of like bang for your buck in terms of like a hy hypertrophy effect. Does that mean on the way down? Yeah, it means on the way down. So <laughs> okay. if you think about if you think about doing a curl when your arm is at full extension, mm -hmm. or when you're doing a squat when your butt is like almost to the floor, because yeah. that's when your glute is at its most lengthened state. And so it seems to you see there seems to be a benefit to um, kind of pausing there and really feeling into that portion of the lift, as opposed to counterintuitively when the muscle is more contracted and in its, in its shortened state. So I've been really focusing on those portions of my lifts, and I've seen some pretty epic progress. Are you doing cardio separately then? Yeah, but I'm not a big cardio. I do a lot of walking. Mm -hmm. Walking is by far my favorite form of cardio. And then I'll do some light running, which I think is zone two. So it's like a, a jog just faster than a brisk walk for me is very sustainable. But I don't do any, I don't do a lot of cardio beyond that. Do you have a goal of how many steps you want to get each day? I mean, I know there's debate about the ideal number. I think 10,000 has been kind of um, recognized as an arbitrary uh, goal. But there do seem, there was a, a just to like throw some data at it, there was a meta-analysis that came out recently that found that for younger people, anywhere between seven and 10,000 steps a day is generally in that range of optimal. Mm -hmm. um, and I personally, I know that I feel way better. I just, 
a, you know, subjectively N of one, I feel great when I'm able to walk more. I was in London recently. We were talking about this when you were on my show. So shredded there. You're so shredded. <laughs> 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 we were, Crosby and I were talking about this last night. When you're in when you're in New York, cities where you can like just take off on foot. The best. It's the best. You, I mean, you have such a wider, so much wider of a buffer for what you can eat, basically, yeah. and you just end up shredded. After every meal, I think going on walks for digestion yeah, is incredible. It's amazing for blood sugar balance, all that. Yeah, it's, it's so huge. good. Yeah, we That's actually. That's why people in New York and London and these like bigger cities that you have to walk. Like, I love it. They stay lean regardless of their yeah. extracurricular activities. They're, exactly, they're at dinner by nine ten. Yeah, you know, which is but crazy. We would never do that all day. Yeah. So it's not affecting them as much as somebody that's like sedentary in Los Angeles for the whole day and then they eat at 10. Like that's not. LA is tough to that's get the walk. That's the worst in. part of LA in I know. my view. Yeah. Is the fact that it's so difficult to walk. You have to be so intentional. I just end up going in loops around yeah. my neighborhood. <clears throat> yeah. I'm kind of the opposite of Max in terms of my background. I played sports my whole life. Uh, I was a football player in college. We did very strenuous workouts and exercises like all day long. We went, you know, we're doing 6 a.m. lift and then we got to come back for like a three hour practice at the end of the day. Cardio in the morning sometimes, but like four or five in the morning, we're running, you know, two, three miles. So I grew up putting a lot of like basically damage on my body uh, in my early stages. And it turned into some like slightly chronic festering injuries that I had that weren't like, oh, I can't do anything, but it was always something like, oh, it's just a little bit weaker or like my psoas is, I don't know if you're familiar with the psoas muscle, but it operates in a way to where like it affects a lot of other muscles. And when that is wrecked and like tight, it's tough to really do anything. Like I haven't done core workouts for years oh, wow. because instead of planks, just because that muscle is, um, just it it responds a lot differently like right away like it'll create inflammation if i'm doing too much core stuff or like too heavy of like squatting like any of those kind of ranges of motion um, can definitely affect the psoas muscle so i as i got older i started to turn to like low impact approaches to working out i even it's hilarious but i even got contracted to do a low impact workout dvd dvd oh. in london wow. <laughs> do you remember that when yeah, that came yeah, out yeah. kind of uh, bringing in the psoas to a lot of different lifts. Mm -hmm. um, so I have like certain splits, like bodybuilding splits, but uh, Can for you the tell most us what part, they are? Because I know people are gonna ask. <laughs> uh, I, my splits are chest and arms, mm -hmm. back and shoulders, and then legs. So you are training legs? Oh yeah. <laughs> we, like, we like to hear that. Yeah, major glute workouts. Okay. Skip leg day. Yeah. I think a lot of men skip leg day. Do you skip leg day, Max? Never. No. Okay, I think great. less and less now, though. They're really? realizing how important. Yeah, well, there's so many studies talking about how leg workouts are so important for, like, growth hormone activity and boost, you know. So men want that, too. They're not, like, just building their upper body. And, and how many days a week are you both weight training? I weight train f probably five days a week mm -hmm. I love it I mean I, I really love it and just to add to the leg day thing I think for me the turning point when I really started to enjoy leg day was understanding that we're all biomechanically different and I think one of the problems that you get in the f with the fitness community particularly online is you know people see these really jacked people on social media now doing all kinds of crazy lifts with a focus generally around squatting and deadlifting and perpetuating this idea, whether they're doing it wittingly or not, that you've got to squat and deadlift to 
get the body of your dreams, so to speak. But everybody's different. And I personally, like if I deadlift, I've never been able to deadlift properly, even under the watchful eye of people who really know what they're doing. I'm in pain days afterwards, whether or not it hurts in the moment. I have like chronic low back issues. So for me, it was really about self-experimentation mm -hmm. experimentation, and and finding the workouts like that work best for me and yeah. and after finding them um, I really enjoy doing it so for one like the Bulgarian split squat is something that doesn't irritate my back at all great and lift. it feels great yeah. those are gnarly though fantastic they're gnarly lift. but I don't do back squats I don't deadlift that's I, my favorite glute workout for sure and Bulgarian great for women squat. too amazing hmm. because 95 percent of my audience is women so I know they're gonna have questions I love the Bulgarian split squat so good but I agree 100 percent max I think online especially for women a lot of the girls in the fitness industry are short and if you come in as a taller girl, it can be confusing, I think, mm. because they just grow muscle in a different way. Of course. Like the squat is completely different. I personally love a hip thrust. I think those are great and I love lunging. Mm -hmm. But everyone's different. Everyone's different, yeah. Yeah, the body types, you know, you're probably more of, at this point now, you're probably more of an ectomorph. Um, what does that mean? It means that you probably are, you stay leaner now. Mm -hmm. and, yes. And longer, you're tall. Uh, so you're, your food's going to be differently for your gains as well. Mm -hmm. When it comes to like mesomorphs that you're kind of talking about that are a little bit more compact, yeah. they're going to be the type of, you know, person that works out that can grow muscle quickly and they kind of have to watch out for more of like the fat gain. Mm, so, yeah. cause they, if they overeat certain things, but it's all, you know, there's, there's a lot, tons of guides out there. Now a lot of people are like, putting those three things together, endomorph, ectomorph, mesomorph, as their like parameters for, hey guys, come train with me. Like these are the three body types. Like what do you fall under? And then here's your training regimen. Here's your dietary regimen for this. Here's how you could supplement, which it works in a lot of ways, but I don't think it's end all be all. And a lot of the time too, like a lot of these people are not really preaching the greatest nutrition when it comes to the level that you would like to be eating when it comes to like organic or wild or this it's just like macros right which is what i love about <laughs> podcasts i think it's a great opportunity to speak with experts and have people wherever they are with whatever their knowledge level be able to tune in and learn more mm -hmm. with nutrition i want to talk about your pre and post workout rituals what are we eating what supplements are we taking max yeah. we start yeah, I definitely have leaned into the pre-workout and even intra-workout carbohydrates as of late. I, I think when I first started, I, there was a period where I was very much, much more of a, of a carbophobe. Um, huge I, carbophobe. I wouldn't say huge. I just... I was too at some point. I was like, when, when the Bulletproof thing was happening, I was like very keto at times i'm a, I, I'm a carbophobe yeah eating I'm not lots of vegetables i'm not and lots afraid of, of them i'm just like and i was wrecked i prefer to not yeah at the I, moment i think people need to know that carbs don't make you carbs don't necessarily make you fat <clears throat> carbs are not in, inherently fattening and not only that but they can be an incredibly powerful tool to use to have better workouts and when you have a the better your workouts are the more muscle the more you're going to divert any excess of calories into processes that promote muscle growth. And so I love carbohydrates now pre-workout. I have more energy in the gym and that incre that ends up having all these downstream effects that help you ultimately burn more fat. So carbs pre-workout are incredible. I've been like really leaning into whether it's fruit, like a, you know, bananas or um, I've even been like experimenting with some overnight oats, which I really enjoy, which if you would have asked me five years ago, my thoughts on oatmeal, I would have basically called them little more than glorified cattle feed. But but now I feel like they're actually a really powerful functional food um, to be used for that purpose to, as, a, as a performance enhancing tool. And so I'll do some carbs pre-workout, I'll do some protein pre-workout, um, whether in the form of a protein shake or some eggs. Uh, I really like casein protein lately um, so I think whey is fantastic, but I'm also a big fan or whatever protein. I mean, ultimately whatever protein you, you like is fine. But, um, lately I've been enjoying casein, which is a much slower digesting protein. And then if I'm eating something pre-workout, I don't necessarily feel like I need to run to eat protein post-workout because that idea of the anabolic window has been sort of, um, 
new research has come out showing that it's kind of a myth. That you know, thirty minute window. Yeah, I mean, when I was when I first started training twenty something years ago, I thought, like many did, that if you didn't eat protein immediately post workout, all gains were lost. Right. It was like a sprint home, <laughs> like sprint home to get that protein <laughs> shake. You know. Yeah. Uh, but now I think we know, particularly if you've got, if you're, if you've got amino acids in circulation from a prior meal, there's really no rush. So I'll, you know, at some point make my way over to like where I, a place to get lunch or I'll go home and cook something. But I don't, I no longer feel that, that sense of urgency. Well, you're not waiting like two hours. But I'm not, yeah, I mean. You're still Crosby's eating. like. <laughs> I mean, but you're still eating within an hour of the workout. Yeah, but yeah. even if but even if I if I had a meal pre-workout, I would wait an hour, hour and a half, two hours. There's a, the, the point is you have a lot more flexibility, which I think is empowering, to eat, to consume that protein. So you know, ultimately what matters is like the amount of protein that you're consu- consuming over a 24-hour period. Are you hitting your protein goal? So you don't, th- you don't think that when you go through a really heavy lift and you're breaking the muscle tissue down extremely in that lift, even if you had some carbs and protein pre and during, that you, would, you wouldn't want to go get some food within an hour of that, that training? Because yeah. I personally feel inflamed if I wait too long. Hmm. Because I feel very like catabolic. I feel like I'm, my body's just breaking down. Do you think yeah, that's but mental? I'm also very lean, so I think that no, it's not mental because I can literally feel it in my stomach. Oh wow! Um, like an inflammatory like feeling that I need to like replenish my system from, but maybe it's because I'm at a, like a point in my um, body composition that there's like not a ton of room. Mm-hmm. How long are you to training sit, for? to like not have food for a certain amount of time because I ver- operate very yeah. low body fat, so like. I have to like it's like have to eat, mm. but I'm not like Greg like is you said, the same way. I yeah, will I'm say I'm not rushing to force myself a protein shake within ten minutes of like my last lift, because there's also something about um, the your stress hormone post workout. You still have a little bit of you know if you've done a ha- some heavy training, there's some cortisol there, and you're 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 there's a valve in your stomach that could actually close up uh, if you're too stressed right after a workout that you're not going to absorb the nutrients anyway. So it's better to like be calm, mm. have like do some, you know, be breathing properly half, half an hour, 45 minutes later, an hour later, go get your next, go get your meal and eat it calmly as opposed to like in this rush state, which most people do. They, they get done with a workout and they have to rush to work or whatever. And they're like force feeding their next meal. Yeah. And then a lot of the time that can cause a lot of stomach upset because it's not, going to actually digest as properly as it should in terms of like the anabolic catabolic response for me like i can actually notice post-workout if i don't get enough food that i feel way flatter mm. greg is the same way and if i eat a decent amount of carbs and protein and i get my like those good nutrients to replenish like glycogen and and to help me recover better with the amino acids that i get then i can tell that i feel like denser and fuller within 45 minutes of my training i think what you said about eating in the sympathetic mode is so true i think so many people rush they're on the laptop they're driving they're eating in this like panic state and it creates digestion issues i've been really Mm. conscious about it lately and putting my phone away and just like breathing before i eat yeah i think so many people could do that also just want to comment on the oats because I don't know if you guys saw, I just did an interview with Paul Saladino. Hates, he hates them, I bet. He hates oats. And we were talking about glyphosate and the effects of oats on gut health. I want to hear your guys' take. There is a apparently 100% glyphosate-free oat. I have them. Zigo. Zigo. Mm-hmm. They I have them too. Yeah. They're great. They taste great. I, I'll eat some oats here and there too. I don't like to eat a ton of carbs before I train for some reason. Like it just... I think Max has better digestion than me and he's able to like break down food a little bit better because of my gut issues from the past. Like if I eat a bunch of carbs, I feel like I don't even want to go to the gym. That's how I feel. Like I just feel like tired and yeah. don't want to go. But I still do get some carbs. Like I'll I'll bodybuild it and put in like a carb, a very fine like carb powder that's like specific for training. Hmm. Um, what is it called? Do you know? They're like cyclic dextrin type 
powders that are made from like potato and rice, mm-hmm. but they're they absorb differently. So like you don't get this like crazy blood sugar spike. You actually, it's kind of proven that you don't get any blood sugar spike. It's more of just like a f- carb that fills the muscle tissue when you're training. So I'll still get some carbs like in a drink, but I'll make like a pre-workout drink after I have, I have like a protein coffee in the morning. I still been, I've been doing this for- With butter? I still do the butter. Hmm. I don't do the the coconut oil or MCT oil anymore. So I just do the So you've been a butter fan. Ton, yeah. You never stopped. Never stopped. He's probably the biggest butter fan I know. You're probably like the OG butter influencer. <laughs> he really I, is. <laughs> I, I'm a, I'm dairy, I'm very, dairy friendly and we're gonna diet. talk yeah. about that for sure but, but yeah so i'll have my protein coffee which i'll throw like certain things in it glycine lion's mane inositol like certain things that are gonna activate the coffee a little better and also i'll take certain supplements while i have my coffee like ashwagandha and certain things because i can't put i can't drink coffee more, more than once a day mm. like i'll get spun out if i drink a coffee at 4 p.m so in the way that that works with the protein and the fat is it slows the absorption of the caffeine. I feel way more steady and focused as opposed to like jittery, right? So then I'll work on my company and do certain content stuff, whatever I'm doing in the morning for two to three hours before I'm even having my next thing, which is my pre-workout drink before the gym. And I'll do it, I'll have it with like half a banana or a whole banana, depending on my, my training to get a little bit of sugar with the amount of amino acids because I'll take two, three scoops of, of essential amino acids powder in my drink along with like creatine and cordyceps and electrolytes. And I'll like soup up this pre-workout drink, like make my own thing. Um, healer's tea, which I brought for you guys to try. Oh, I'm so excited. Dendrobium stem. We have it next to us. Uh, Wait, tell is, us about that. Which is really, really, really incredible stuff. And not a lot of people know about it. I've kind of tried to explain this to a lot of people that are like, I'm all constantly dehydrated. Like, what should I do? Say the name of it again. This product's uh, called Healer's Tea by Dragon Herbs. Uh, it's a herb shop that I used to work for back back in the day. That's where I kind of like got certified. Oh my God, that tastes so interesting. It tastes good. Is this for me? Yeah, try it. Yeah. Whoa. And the main ingredient is something called dendro- dendrobium stem. And dendrobium stem is incredible because wow, it's, it's an astringent and holder of our fluids, which are very important for our vitality, our skin complexion, our sexual energy, like men that are having a lot of sex and releasing mm. a, a lot of the time. This is like quintessential What about for because women? it's going to replenish that type of energy for them. Like core yin jing energy is this is the number one thing that you could be drinking for women too. women don't have the same problem as men when it comes to sexual function like that. Like you guys actually gain energy from orgasm, but, um, everybody I think is chronically like most people are chronically dehydrated. And complexion we love. And Mm. of course it's a beauty tonic. It's an anti-aging tonic. Anything that like revitalizes the body on a deep level, like deep mineral level. And also, um, holding because a lot of us like sweat a lot or pee a lot or like release our fluids in a lot of way throughout the day this helps to like lock them in more Mm. so um i love to put this in my my drink too because i like my body's like constantly getting rid of fluids like sweat like i feel like I, i pee pretty often like i think that there's something in the anabolic nature of that Mm. that you do that more often i pee a lot too yeah um so same i wonder if that's something what's wrong with us i I don't know yeah like me on a plane it's also like our Mm. systems are probably designed well to excrete Mm. excess toxins like often throughout the day especially if you're taking a lot of different supplements that help detoxification right like if you're i i wake up glutathione like every morning like Mm -hmm. that's definitely going to be do you inject glutathione or do you do liposomal just liposomal in the morning yeah okay rectally right (laughs) if they had it yeah why not what do you mean not every morning i mean that's glutathione up your butt i have no idea i mean people are putting all kinds of things up yeah suppositories you've never done a suppository no let's talk about it i know people who like drink take coffee up their butts well that's a coffee enema yeah Yeah, what do you put up your butt in fraternities i've tried i've tried nad like in your, your butt, butt hole. Yeah, this this guy that I know, he sells a um, 
a suppos an NAD suppository. He's like, oh, try this. Wow, fascinating. Yeah. And you did it. Yeah, it was it was okay. I kind of prefer the NAD. I like the like insulin injection. Yeah, I like the NAD shots. Yeah. I did one the shots. two days ago. Do you feel weird afterwards? Of course. The head rush. I get this weird like buzzing in my body. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it. This they say that it wherever it's buzzing is where you need the most help in your cells. Oh my god. So if yours buzzing in your head, then maybe it's more of like brain type oh. stuff potentially mine always goes to my stomach so and i know my stomach's my weak link let's talk about gut health for a second because you've had a lot of gut health issues and i know you talk about gut health let's talk about ways that Max people like a <laughs> iron stomach that guy am i yeah but you talk have about you, gut health yeah you don't have any issues you've never no really i've never had, had no 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 but not, let's talk about like ways yours. people yeah, but you you'll, you'll you won't eat like inflammatory stuff either it's not like you'll chow down on a sandwich with a bunch of wheat no but i'm pretty sensitive in the sense that i uh i think one of the things today that we're seeing a lot of that people aren't talking about enough is um this flood on the market of fake f of fibers essentially of, mm -hmm. of f isolated fiber extracts that now comprise many of our sugar-free keto better for you products everywhere and Do you mean like psyllium husk or something? Mm -mm. I actually think psyllium husk is great. Okay. I'm talking about more like tapioca Chick starch root. fiber or inulin chicory root fiber. They tend to be sweet. You tend to find them in a lot of sugar, quote unquote, sugar free products. I tried um, a vegan ice cream the other day from the farmer's market and it had tapioca in it and I felt like shit the whole night. Yeah, I think a lot of these are, first of all, it's it's quite, it's in, still in question as to whether or not these fibers functionally act like fiber, mm. which by definition wouldn't be absorbed by the host, meaning the person eating the, the product, because um, fiber is typically unabsorbed. It's a, it's a non-digestible uh, form of carbohydrate. But a lot of these fibers actually do get absorbed. There have been some people online to surface, um, whether it's through CGM use or whatever, that they actually do lead to a blood sugar spike. But then I think the bigger problem is that you eat too much of them and it feeds one very specific type of gut bacteria. And that whatever that strain happens to be for that particular fiber, they go into a feeding frenzy, which creates all kinds of gas and bloating for people. And um, you might be able to tolerate a certain dose of the fibers, but um, I think, you know, a lot of people today, it's like a, tr like a literal trend on TikTok, hot, like hot girl stomach problems or something like that. Yeah, right? IBS. Yeah, IBS. Sibo. Yeah, like so a lot of Sibo. people are walking around bloated and uncomfortably gassy, and it's because of these products that they're, that they're indulging in that have this health halo. And what people fail to realize is that these isolated fiber extracts are actually, you know, can wreck the gut. Yeah. I had so. about three spoonfuls of that tapioca ice cream and I felt horrible. Really? Yeah, I think I don't really eat things like that very often, but I just felt awful. Ta tapioca is a s more of a starchy, it's more of a starch than a fiber, no? Well, it depends. They have, there's tapioca starch and then there's tapioca fiber. Mm. Yeah. So what would you guys say are some things people at home can do to improve their gut health? Oh man, so many things. Um, a lot of the things that fixed my gut were to realize, to think of my gut as more of an injured part of my body. So like, what do you do when your, your hamstrings injured? You need to rest it. So same thing with the gut. Like if the gut needs rest, the last thing you want to do is be eating a ton of hard to digest foods. Such as? Such as like raw vegetables that have a lot of like cellulose when we don't have cellulase enzyme to break down the cellulose. So it's just turning into this, all this roughage that could potentially be good for somebody that wants to have a lot of fiber and be full faster. But for someone that has a gut issues, it's like the last thing you'd want to do is eat a lot of like, you know, cruciferous vegetables, raw, like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kale, especially kale. Um, it have have lots of nuts and seeds in your diet because those are hard to break down. There's also a lot of phytic acid. Like there's so many different inflammatory things that could be happening when you have a plethora of different foods that you might think are considered health foods, but you're going through a different type of 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 lifestyle at the time than somebody that's just has great gut health. You know, so you got to think about it differently. So because I was doing all the wrong things when my gut was really uh, destroyed at the time. And then when I started kind of listening to myself, I'm like, okay, let's just keep it simple. 
uh, things that I was scared of for a long time, like white rice because the carbs. I started eating white rice and feeling so much better. I was getting like energy from it and like it didn't hurt my stomach. It was easily to break it was easy to break down. So like simple carbohydrates that were easy to break down, simple proteins that were easy to break down. Um, eating more fruit, cleansing kind of like items like that that I thought like, oh my God, the sugar, like don't do that. Like everything that I thought I should not be doing, I started doing instead. Mm. And I started to feel so much better. Um, not eating like tons of fat in each meal, especially the ones that are slower fats, like more of the vegetable family fats are actually slower metabolically than something like butter or um, meat, you know, the fat from meat. Um, if you're eating two avocados a day, that's pretty slow digesting food. So I kind of cut out a lot of these foods and that was like the first step that really helped my gut uh, feel a lot better. And then I started introducing things that I knew I had to kill some pathogens off. So certain things that were good, like antifungals, antibacterials, um, Pau Arco was something that was really good at the time for me because it was pretty mild in nature. I didn't want to have these like crazy die off symptoms. What is that? <clears throat> it's a bark hmm. and it's uh, really good for like candida overgrowth. Got it. So you can take it in pill form. It's actually very cheap, um, very effective. Uh, and no, there's other s certain types of antifungals that are great. Uh, something like oregano oil would always stir me up way too much. So I kind of had to pull back on that one. But it's good garlic, you know, sometimes people do well on, on those kind of supplements. And then I moved into like spore-based probiotics and things that actually got to my small intestine where I was having issues as opposed to taking a, I was always getting probiotics from the store that were in the refrigerator. And it's like, I should have thought about it. If they're in the refrigerator, how, how well they're going to do in my hot system mm -hmm. inside my body? Probably not well. Probably get killed by my stomach acid right away. Yeah. They don't work, but it's good marketing, right? So learning, getting into this, the, the learning about certain companies that make spore-based probiotics like Just Thrive, Microbiome Labs, that really helped. And then also realizing that a lot of my issues stemmed from having leaky gut syndrome. So learning certain supplements and tools to rest my system, heal my gut lining and permeability that was probably way bigger than it should have been and that you know got me into like the colostrum world and glutamine and some of these amino acids like proline and glycine that really helped to like seal the gut lining uh, that are in some cool supplements and kind of like it's a dance when you're gut because if you're if you're listening and you have gut issues you know there's like this weird dance where you do some stuff then you feel like shit for a second then you pull back and then you do some other things and you feel good and and you think you're okay and then you start eating some like foods that you're not used to eating again and all of a sudden everything's back mm. so there's the gut is just so sensitive and when you have debilitated it in, so, in that kind of like fashion it takes a while you know maybe years to really f get back to feeling better and um, it took me a long time, but you know, there was a lot of different things that I tried and now I kind of live that lifestyle on a daily basis. Like I won't eat gluten, I don't drink alcohol. I, I, I kind of stay away from all the inflammatory things that I know would upset my stomach and potentially cause me to have like a flare up in some kind of way and be right back where I started, where I had you know, more severe gut issues than I do now. I'm pro I feel like 98% now. Like every once in a while, I'm like, oh, what was that? Like, mm -hmm. But it's become but, a lifestyle to where it's not such an effort every day. Yeah, it's become a lifestyle that I enjoy. Yeah. You know, I, I, there's certain foods that I really love to eat on a regular basis. And uh, I know they make me feel good. Mm -hmm. And that's my number one is to feel good every day. So I just don't do the other things that I know. Like next day, I'm going to wake up and just feel horrible. What are your views on colostrum? Because colostrum is really having a moment right now and I'm seeing it marketed as like this cure all supplement. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, I had um, uh, the founder of a colostrum company on my, on my podcast and she also happens to have a medical background. So I thought it was a really cool person to, to get the skinny on, on this product that everybody seems to be talking about. I think it, makes sense that it would have all you know it would have immunomodulating 
bioactives in it. Um, you know, so I, I've been experimenting with it, taking it. For the impact that it could potentially have on immune function, I've been actually giving it to my cat. Hmm. Who ha- who suffers from chronic upper respiratory infections? Delilah. Delilah, yeah, she has. Um... Sorry, Delilah, I'm gonna have to out you, but she has feline herpes, oh. and so yeah. I'm gonna have to out you. Yeah. She's listening to this right now, screaming. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Poor, poor, Delilah. poor D money. It's very common in cats. It's super contagious, and they get it from usually the whatever kennels, you know. Before, Can they transfer it to humans prior to be being adopted? <laughs> no, they can't. Oh. Yeah, you're good then it's very different it's an upper oh. respiratory thing it's like a it's like a respiratory thing and um oh it's i got it yeah it's a. but it leaves her vulnerable to um chronic secondary bacterial infections so she's always going to have this herpes but it flares up and when it flares up she's just sneezing and blowing boogers all over the house it's like really gross adorable but very gross and um so i've been giving her i've been mixing colostrum into her food and it seems to have, it seems to be keeping the infections at bay. It's completely an anecdote. I don't, you know, have any, I don't want to make any crazy claims, but I've been just at wit's end trying to figure out how to, like, prevent these these chronic infections for her. And so, um, and so I think, yeah, I think the research is interesting on it. I don't, you know, I don't have any dog in the fight, but, um, but I've been experimenting with it. And, you know, the, the, the science seems sound, although there's not a ton of it. And uh, and yeah, and bodybuilders, right, have been using it for for a long time for its yeah, potentially it's, anabolic effects. No, I think it's a obviously an amazing nutrient. I mean, it's the first milking that a newborn calf gets from their mother. You know, it's the uh, the breast milk, human breast milk, and you know, cow's milk. The the first milking, its main job when it's being given to the calf in that moment is from my research is when you know the fetus is inside and it's getting nutrients from the mother through um through the placenta the gut wall is actually perforated so it it can allow for nutrients to pass through so when you get out of the womb you don't want to have a perforated gut because now it's like it's you're not getting nutrients that way right so the the colostrum that you get is supposed to seal that up Hmm. which is why people take it now for leaky gut stuff because it has certain growth factors and amino acids that help seal that back up so that you have a tight wall junction gut wall instead of something that can seep through into the bloodstream and you're good. But a lot of people grew up that they didn't get breastfed. They got formula right away. And then they realize years later that it's one of the main reasons they have all these gut issues because their gut never got sealed back up. So they've always had different allergies or you could get, you know, more susceptible to certain um, chronic uh, illnesses and autoimmune stuff because of that. So I think that's like a really amazing thing about colostrum. Um, And I think that's a a reason, the growth factors is a big reason why a lot of people in the fitness industry are taking it because it helps. It's supposed to be considered in Chinese medicine, it's like the yin form of like growth hormone. Whereas like deer antler is the yang form. So like together, I had a, a friend that was like obsessed with elk velvet or deer antler and colostrum and he would pair them together and had people all over the, the, the country like getting it from him and, and doing this like years ago. And it's a definitely gives you an edge in terms of that kind of, um, but I think that I just put it straight into my mouth. I think it. T- I mean, part of it is that I think it tastes really good on its yeah. own. Yeah, it's also such a little amount that you get in these like little jars that everybody's selling because it is pricier than just like selling your milk powder. Are you guys taking it in a powder form or a capsule? Powder. I just. Put I it would. Straight I into would. My mouth. Yeah, oh, wow. I take like a lot at a time. Okay, and like, is it considered dairy or not? It's dairy. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, and you enjoy it. What brand is your favorite? My my favorite brand is Equip Foods. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think I, th- I need to start taking it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, ca- I can't personally speak to any objective, real sense of any you know with one hundred percent certainty benefits that I've that I've seen from it. But um, I think the science is super interesting, and I think it's probably worth a shot, particularly if you have gut issues. And um, 
I had the the founder of Armra on my podcast, and they have since become a sponsor. So I just want to put that disclosure out there. But um, but yeah, I've been using it because I have it, and uh, and I enjoy it. I see them everywhere. I want to ask you guys about peptides. Do you either of you use peptides? Slash, can you define peptides for us? Can you define peptides? Nice. A peptide is a protein. Yeah. But so, but the ones that we're talking about, it's like a sequence. A right. chain, like a, basically a message. The injectables or the orals that, that people are taking to enhance recovery, to enhance gut yeah. health. Yeah. What do you guys think? Not my wheelhouse. I mean, I've tried, um, first of all, semaglutide is a peptide, which Ozempic is. Oh, so Ozempic's yeah. a so peptide. Is, and yeah. so is insulin, yeah. apparently, is a peptide. Oh, I didn't know yeah. that. So peptides are super, super common, but now they're being used for, I think the most common of them are growth hormone secretagogues, which basically you inject or you can take orally that stimulate the release of your own growth hormone, which can help support um, collagenous tissue in the body, tendon health and things like that, joint health and stuff. Recovery time. Recovery time, et cetera. There are some that purport to benefit um, gut health. So there's like a whole menu now of, of available peptides. And I think the the research on them is is interesting, but yeah, not my, not my wheelhouse. Yeah, it's kind of, a new world, definitely in the bodybuilding world too. Um, a lot of people at the gym are using certain peptides. You can even get peptides that are like specifically like IGF one, like growth, like growth factor peptides. Mm. Um, but the most common ones that people are using are like BPC one five seven, like TB five hundred, uh, CJC epimorlin. Like these are like some growth hormone secretagogues, like Max, Max was saying, but also um, something like BPC-157, I've used plenty of times for more of the oral for gut stuff because it stands for body protection compound and the, the BPC-157 is actually from, uh, uh, which is kind of weird, but human gastric juice. That's how they extract, that's how they make it. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. I, I'm using it right now. You got the pills? Yeah. Where'd you, where'd you, uh, from a, Greg. from a, pharm like a, from a pharmacy, yeah. From a pharmacy, yeah. So like pharmaceutical grade BPC-157, it's like helps with overall systemic inflammation, brings that down. It's amazing for, uh, as the pill for overall like leaky gut syndrome and gut health, brings that inflammation down. Also helps like um, keep all your uh, immune function and antibodies like balanced so that you're not getting this overreaction mm. uh, in, this, in your system. Because when your gut's inflamed, like you can start develop certain overreactive type like autoimmune s s uh, situation as well so that's why i think ppc 157 is amazing and i've used it as the pill i've only used it i've injected it once tried it i didn't love it mm. i think the pill is like for me uh where it's at I haven't used it in a while but i would i would go back to it because i think that there is a number of benefits that it has and they they really haven't shown like that there's too many different side effects Obviously, these things are kind of new to humans, but <clears throat> for the most part, I feel like a lot of these things that are that do really, really well and that really help us are things that like certain industries want to shut down because right. they help us. Heal and just faster. to be clear, peptides are legal. Yeah. Correct. F pharmaceutically, yeah, they, yeah, they're legal. Yeah, you can even get them online. Like, I don't know how good the certain sources are mm -hmm. when you just go direct to the source. I would go through. A, a company like get blood work understand what you're doing and then have the them prescribe and like get it sent from pharmacy for sure a lot of these optimal doctors have mm. them so i think that's where i got ours okay last question is about male mental health oh cool this is a female audience for the most part and we talk a lot about body positivity, body dysmorphia, things of that topic. I don't see a lot of men talking about that topic. And I'm curious in the health industry as men, do you guys feel a certain level of pressure to look a certain way? Do you feel any toxicity in that environment? And how do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, I thankfully don't feel a ton of pressure because my <laughs> personal brand, I mean, I hate using that term, but it's really never been about showing myself shirtless or or even influencing for that matter. I mean, I'm primarily a journalist and an author and um, and the podcast sort of come as a secondary outlet for me, but... Um, People that are shirtless on there all the time are so cringe, huh? 
<laughs> so great. Yeah. At Crosby. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I'll occasionally post. I'll, I'll post the occasional thirst trap. Why not? You know, I'm not. I'm not above it. I'm not above it. It's but usually a mere selfie. I also it's, feel like for you, like if you were overweight, it would be questionable. Well, I also think I'm not particularly genetically gifted. I'm not an athlete, as we talked about earlier in the episode. And so for me, I really do work very hard for my for you know the the mental health um benefits that i see from the gym but also my physique and feeling good and 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 essentially looking and feeling like an athlete even though i'm not an athlete you know i'm i can I'm, attest that max has gotten in amazing yeah shape you look great max. thank you thank yeah. you thank you um He's gotten super jacked no so i put in i put in a lot of work and i try to take a really like evidence-based science-based approach to my to my training and whatnot but no mental health is a huge portion of it and you really have to get your mental health right i mean obviously training and good nutrition can all be supportive can all be an adjunct to good mental health and there's a growing body of research showing that um you know diet can actually be used as a treatment modality for for mental health issues right it's not a cure-all and it certainly doesn't um you know isn't going to be applicable to every single person but um but then also conversely i think you know by really focusing specifically on your mental health, that's going to be what's going to help you to sustain these healthy habits that are going to, that, that create that feedback loop that, that ultimately are what lead to these long-term changes, both in your physique and your, and your health ultimately. Um, and so for me, I think therapy personally has played a, a big role in that. I, um, it took me 30 something years to, to see a therapist because it can be hard to find the right therapist. It can be expensive. Um, but seeing a therapist for me was really helpful in terms of understanding where some of the, for example, issues that I have in relationships, you know, come, come, comes from. Um, and really getting to put those under the magnifying glass. I think bu- f- developing a healthy, healthier relationship with social <coughs> media is really important. I think we underappreciate the detrimental effects that chronic social media use can have on mental health and i you know as somebody with a with a platform like like you like crosby but even if you don't have a platform like we live in a a really weird time where the marketplace has now become globalized in the sense that you can be essentially a civilian and put something crazy online and then and suddenly fall under the scrutiny of the entire universe it seems and so having a healthy relationship with that and realizing that social media isn't real life, um, I think can be, can be really helpful. Um, and yeah, and, and, and continually reminding yourself that the most important things in life are, you know, sometimes require a bit of attention. You've got to like water the flowers in your life, so to speak, and fostering those relationships, whether it's with your friends or your family, loved ones, I think all can go a really long way towards, um, yeah, towards towards helping facilitate good mental health, which is so important. I love that. Crosby, yeah, agreed. you oh, are Christ. you are in the modeling industry mm-hmm. and I think you act a little bit as well. How about you in terms of body image? Yeah, the modeling thing is not as serious as it used to be, but it definitely was tough back in the day. Like in my in my mid 20s when I was in New York and London and lot and modeling more often, um, I definitely was I definitely had body dysmorphia. I was way too skinny. I couldn't even, I look back on photos and I'm like, how was that me? And how did I not realize that, you know, now? Um, but the industry, it's like really easy to fall trap into that world. Uh, especially when, in a, when it comes to like c- pictures and being on camera, you actually do look a little differently. And so like everybody's trying to get as lean and, and cut as possible to have that like great image. Cause I did a lot more like underwear and like body stuff. So I was always trying to be the leanest I could be. And I got to a point where I got way too skinny. So when I built my body back up and I started to feel healthier and stronger and um, more fit and more muscular, I was like, oh, I wish I would have been like this then um, because that was actually what was being booked too anyways, Mm -hmm. was the more like masculine, muscular fit guy. And now it's kind of completely the opposite where we it's weird we now live in a world where like being overly muscular or like too fit is kind of like 
weirdly like a turnoff. Yeah, they're not into it anymore. Well, yeah, women aren't into men are into it. Mm. Men to men love it. Mm. You know, women aren't really. I mean, it I feels very speak, niche. It's very niche. I shouldn't speak for all women, but I feel like there is, uh, there has been kind of like a shift yeah. in what is attractive to women, and I um, sometimes feel like because I am very fit. I sometimes feel self-conscious about that because now I'm like, I and mean, it's not easy meeting women a lot of the time. And I feel like I don't know what it is. And sometimes the people that I'm meeting are maybe not as attuned with their like health and fitness and lifestyle. And then they see me and they're like, that's like, he's obsessed with all of that kind of thing. Um, but it's more because I just really enjoy feeling good. And feeling good in my body and feeling strong and feeling like able and 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 can go like lift weights whenever I want or go play volleyball on the weekend or like go do, you know, things with friends and, and go hiking and just feel good all the time. And I don't, you know, I, the I don't mind having like being in shape myself. Like it's great. I love it. But I think that there's ha there's been some like weird kind of shift where it's like not really in like mm -hmm. back in like the arnold days it's like that's all it was well, also yeah. you have the media saying things like fitness well that's kind of what i'm kind of getting right, at right wing yeah. extremists exactly you know, which, not a political it's not like, cool wherever you happen it's to be actually, like it's yeah there's bad. This it's considered <laughs> weird I think. it's yeah. considered yeah. weird to be a bodybuilder a little bit which has been interesting because yeah. i when i first met greg or just be into fitness in general right like, extremely into fitness like you're i mean there's weird articles nowadays that are being pumped that it's not cool to be fit and to be healthy, but it's like in to not be. But I think what you said is so true. It gives you a level of freedom that other people don't have. Right. You can hike, you can swim, you can uh, have energy the whole day. I think it gives you a level of freedom that other people may not experience. And that makes it worth the discipline you have to implement throughout the day. Agreed. And it's also great to meet a partner, I think, that's into that with you. Greg and I are both super health obsessed and it has just made it so much more fun for mm. us. Yeah, that's awesome. That's kind of where it's at now, like finding that person that's similar in your health world. Like, well, I don't meet people when I go out. I don't go out, really. So it's like... Which is what most people are doing yeah. to meet other people. It's like a day meet. Yeah. A cute day meet. It's like a grocery store meet or like a gym meet. Yeah, like. you, you're you going to find your person at Air One, I think. Because <laughs> that's where you are 90% of, of the time. That's Both true. of you. Crosby's there 90% of yeah, the time, true. for sure. <laughs> On that topic, I have a rapid fire fan Q&A. Oh, my God. And the first question is, are either of you single, LOL? Oh, wow. <laughs> I kind of knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. Yeah, I'm single. I've been single for some time. Yeah. Happily single. But, um, yeah. Yeah, same. Both happily single, like you're not looking. Well, I'm not necessarily. We have hormones. I'm not necessarily looking to be in a relationship per se, but I I think it would be nice at this stage to have like a crush, you know, which I haven't had in a, in a while. Well, the girls yeah. are asking, so yeah, maybe this well, will go we have, out. We have DMs, you know. They have DMs. <laughs> it's open, guys. The DMs are open. Good luck with that. The DMs are open. Have fun with that one. Here's the here's the funny thing though. So oftentimes I feel like a whenever somebody will DM, their profile is private. I'm like, what do you want me to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> Why know? don't you follow them? If you're going to DM, because I don't just follow like people I, I, I don't know. I don't even follow everybody that I know, you know, because I, it's just too much. But normal people have private accounts, I think. In, yeah. I, I think mean, we're the I, weird ones. The exception? Yeah. Yeah. I think you should follow back. Interesting. Are you saying that you don't get to know but what then they I, look I'd, like fully? I have from to the... follow back so many people. Oh, that's a flex. You know, I mean, it's like, what am I supposed to do? But really, if you're going to slide in, I think you should make make your profile public. Okay, it, you, you heard it here. If you guys DM Crosby and Max, you have to have a public account. Yeah. C cookie or health questions first. I'm not going to follow back. <laughs> Just kidding. Based on like By that. the way, I mean, are we going to, we got to eat some. I know. Crosby I brought, brought his healthy stuff. baked goods and we're going to yeah. try some. Okay, Let's cool. try them at the end. Great. Um, but if you guys get in relationships, I'm going to take credit. Deal. Cool. You get to share the wedding. One thing everyone should eat more of and one thing everyone should eliminate. Oh, man. One thing everybody should eat more of. Well, I don't... I think everybody, you know, everybody's different. There's no one-size-fits-all diet. But I will say that I think... <clears throat> 
lean red meat is a superfood, particularly if grass-fed, grass-finished. And um, I know a lot of people, particularly women, who would be well suited to eat more to eat more red meat. Less of what? What should Less we eliminate? Less of ooh. I mean, I could say something boring like ultra-processed foods that everybody's talking about. Um, I think like ref- refined grain products. You know, like wheat based snacks things like that no more wheat <clears throat> i'd have to say in kind of like counterbalance of max's red meat uh eat more glycine rich foods mm. because i think that as a culture we eat a lot of muscle meat and muscle meat has a high amount of um methionine as max pronounced for me properly earlier <laughs> and uh, glycine rich foods are like collagen, the ligaments and tendons, you know, gelatinous things, uh, as well as um, organs and, and tendons and those kind of things. So like more organ meats, but also like consuming collagen with your muscle meat proteins or having like a glycine supplement. I really love taking my glycine on a regular basis because it tastes good too. It's like very sweet. Um, so I'd say high, high, get more high glycine foods in your diet to like balance the muscle meats that you're eating, especially if you're a meat eater. And then for consuming less of, I'd have to say going back to kind of the fibrous stuff, like these like candies that are super high. Everybody loves these like gummy candies and they don't realize there's literally 20 something grams of inulin fiber per package. Like so a smart sweet. Smart sweet. So if you eat a whole like gummy smart sweet bag, you're getting... 24 grams of inulin fiber from chicory root or whatever that's going to absolutely wreck your stomach for that day and could potentially be contributing to issues you know issues down the line with like SIBO and those kind of things so I would definitely kind of veer clear of the high fiber sugar-free sweets love it seed oils how bad are they I think we know they're bad but like I want to hear your take yeah, I mean, I'm certainly not a fan of seed oils, but I do think that um, the pendulum has really swung so in now in the direction of people thinking that they're the sole source of all of our problems. And I have to concede that um, if you're hyper focusing on on seed oils, you're probably probably missing the big picture. I think for most people, it's it's not necessarily going to be that that's the problem it's going to be the overconsumption of the of ultra processed foods which typically contain them um if you've you know when it comes to the oils that you're bringing into your own home i don't think that there should be any reason look unless you're absolutely broken it's all you have access to but even then i wouldn't there's no necessity for them Um, I would say the primary oil that should be used based on the evidence as well as my own sort of perspective on this should be extra virgin olive oil, which ton of research supporting its, its use, not just for cooking. A lot of people believe, a lot of people, um, uh, wrongly believe that you're not supposed to cook with it. You can cook with it at low to medium temperatures. Um, but also the polyphenols that it contains, these plant, you know, anti-inflammatory compounds, as well as, as its fatty acid profile. It's like the healthiest oil you can you can ingest. Um, so, yeah. But I'm not a fan of seed oils. But I do think that, you know, a lot of people now on social media pointing a finger at them, claiming that they are the smoking gun for all of our health ills. I think that's a bit misguided. Yeah, I agree with Max and a lot of that. Um, I think that it's really just being aware of the products you're eating on a regular basis. And if you are even going to like healthy places and diving into something seed oil rich every day at some point it's definitely going to affect you because of the ratio of like omega-6 to 3 and and the type of an inflammatory type of inflammation that linoleic acid has on the body uh but like if it sneaks into your meal here and there like i don't think it's gonna kill you you know but yeah for the most part i uh, avoid that type of oil also just because we get plenty of that type of fat uh like omega-6 fat and even the animal proteins that we eat too Mm. like it's in meat it's in eggs like it's not in like high concentrations obviously there's better saturated fats and stuff in them as well but like i think that creating like a more balanced ratio like i 
and like you said, I go to Erewhon on a regular basis. Like, I've actually never probably tried it once because I don't like buffalo sauce in general. But I would never eat the buffalo cauliflower there because I don't either. it's deep fried in rice bran oil. Mm-hmm. And if you're eating that every day as your main side, at some point, it's probably not going to be very good yeah. for your metabolism, your system, your body composition, overall like health in, in general. So that's kind of where I would talk about like drawing the line is like the consistency of having these things and also realizing that they're in a lot of health foods. Like it's like sunflower seed, sunflower oil for in, in uh, for instance is actually higher in linoleic acid than canola oil, but people don't realize that mm. they think canola oil is like the, the you know the evil of all of them. Sunflower is actually higher, and it's in tons of health foods. Well, you can find high oleic <laughs> sunflower oil, which I think is pretty yeah, ben- pretty benign. But a lot of the comp- there nobody's using that. Yeah, I mean s- some people some people are. You just have to look on the ingredients list, and if it says high oleic, then because oleic is a mono, Better oleic than, acid yeah, is mono. a monounsaturated fat. So high oleic sunflower oil actually has like a, a fatty acid profile that looks more like avocado oil than soybean oil, which is largely yeah. polyunsaturated. Right. And um, and it, I don't think that there's anything wrong with, wrong with polyunsaturated fats in whole foods at all. Like I think nuts and seeds are great. I think um, <clears throat> fatty fish is loaded with polyunsaturated right. fats, totally great. Within the food matrix, they're protected by antioxidants, and so they're totally fine. The issue is when you get these these oils that are extracted from the food matrix, which is, you know, the case for soybean oil, corn oil, canola oil, and the like. They're exposed to high heat. They undergo intensive processing, and then they're essentially processed again when they're heated in the restaurant setting and used to fry foods in, that those delicate fats then essentially oxidize and mutate and all these oxidative byproducts are created, which are potentially harmful. So um, I think the worst <coughs> form in which they come in is in the, f- is in the fryer setting. And I, and I don't know any nutrition expert who advocates for consuming more fried food. It's usually less fried food. And, uh, and so that's, I think, the, the area where people should really be vigilant to, 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 have, you know, to minimize their consumption. I mean, some fries here and there, no big deal, but it's really like the, the, the restaurant fryer setting is where these oils really become particularly pernicious. Yep. When you guys do drink alcohol, what's the drink of choice? You never, I, I actually I drink occasionally. Drink. I don't drink at all. But yeah. do you do like, do you smoke weed or do mushrooms or anything? Yeah, the occasional mushroom, chocolate, for sure. A little sure. mushroom here yeah. and there. <laughs> like, that's California fine. sober. I, every <laughs> once in a while, back in the day, I would smoke weed, but I I don't, it doesn't agree with me, mm. weed. I just feel, like, very lethargic and... Hungry? Spacey and... Yeah, it's like, it's, it, I'm you know, like, my humor is different at the time, and I'm maybe a little more giggly, but, like, it's not worth it for me but mushrooms i think are great yeah i'm a big fan of a little yeah. microdose a little there. microdose a slight little macrodose there slight macrodose on the yeah. beach why, <laughs> not? why not yeah more micro for me I, I love mushrooms weed i can't stand i don't like what my mind becomes under the influence of, of thc and then alcohol i mean i drink very rarely i would say like once a month if that but um usually it'll be like a clear spirit like a tequila or a a good low sugar red wine. We work with a brand called Dry Farm Wines. Oh, I'm the biggest fan of them. Oh yeah, you had Todd on. I love recently. them. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And the I, wine's amazing. We're not even we're not even sponsored by them, but they just they'll they'll hook us up with wine. I'm not I'm either really... and I sponsor I talk about them on every episode, I swear. Yeah, they're great. Good wine. Yeah, love them. Fantastic guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Please tell us where they can find you online, where <laughs> can they listen to the show, where can they buy the baked goods? Plug ba- it up. Speaking of baked goods. I know. Do you want to try it? I have had plenty. I don't need to try it, but I would love for you and Max to. Let's do it. I'm down. I'm down. Let's do it for social after. Oh, yeah. No worries. Yeah. We'll film it right here. But plug it up. I love that you're writing like show notes as we go. Um, this is, we need she's, this. Yeah, she's, uh, she's on it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Crying. I know, right? <laughs> um... Okay, so I'm very active on Instagram at Max Lugavir, L-U-G-A-V-E-R-E. And um, my podcast is called The Genius Life. So come and say, what's up? Mari 
is has been on it by the at the point at which this airs i'm sure that episode will have been out and uh yeah the genius life on all podcast platforms it's a great podcast i've been on plenty of times yeah too. You have. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a great podcast. You can find me. I'm mostly on Instagram as well at Crosby Taylor, T A I L O R. Uh, and then my company, Crosby's Baking Co.com, where I sell my cookie mixes, gluten, grain, refined sugar free cookie, mi- cookie mixes, and we'll start selling some of my ready to eat products like Blondie's. We're going to move into creating a whole line from the mixes, everything from like brownie, pancake, like all the good stuff. And, uh, Hopefully, I'll expand to some farmers markets around town and and retails here soon too. But you can still order the mixes Crosby's Baking Co. dot com. Amazing, and they're delicious. V and I are a huge fan. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're the best.